<laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Rupa Dot. I'm the Executive Director of Women in Global Health. And um, we faced some technical difficulties this morning, but really appreciate everyone's patience, especially to our speakers and panelists. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you to today's session, um, which is part of the World Health Summit um, Africa Regional Meeting Uganda. And uh, today's session is about the triple gender dividend, investing in the gender uh, quality in the global health and care workforce. Um, it is a um, quite an exciting time uh, as we connect with the, all of you as it is um, a moment where um, gender equality especially is having a special milestone moment. It's 26 years since the original 1995 Beijing Conference on Women's Rights and Gender Equality and the Generation Equality Forum is taking place this year. The first part was in Mexico and the second part is taking place in Paris um, uh, in a virtual conference and um, it is a point in time where we get to really reflect on, you know, where has progress uh, really uh, been stagnant and how can we really accelerate uh, change to make it uh, much more gender equal, especially for the health workforce. And um, I'm going to kick us off with just a couple points for those of you that don't know women in global health. Um, I am uh, one of um, the co-founders and we started in a little over five years ago when we found ourselves asking in a field such as global health, there's so many talented women, but when we take a look at leadership leadership roles, again, women represent um only 25% of those leadership roles. And as we have this um, conversation, uh, really in the context of the Africa continent, we will be hearing from uh, esteemed panelists from all around the world, but especially we know that um, there is a lot of women power in Africa, a lot of expertise and um, a lot of efforts being made to accelerate gender action. And I look forward to really um, you know, sharing um, across the world from colleagues as we really look at the health workforce issues from uh, many different realities. And I'm just going to switch um, uh, to my screen here. And I'll keep this very brief because we did lose a um, bit of time and I want to make sure that you know we hear from our panelists here. So our um, the healthcare workforce situation is that we have 70% healthcare workers, 90% in nursing and um, in some fields even more than 90% are women but only hold 25% of senior roles. Women are clustered into lower status jobs, lower paid jobs, and this is um, compounded by class, caste, ethnicity. Um, the health sector has one of the widest um, gender pay gaps at 28%. Um, it has extreme levels of uh, violence and sexual harassment, um, which is often treated as normal. In some surveys, half of the health and care workers have reported some form of harassment, bullying, um, and sexual harassment. Yet we also know that there's a global shortage of 40 million healthcare workers, 18 million of them in lower middle income countries. And this pandemic has really showed us um, yeah, and magnified a lot of the inequalities in societies, but also showed us uh, and revealed um, the weaknesses in our health systems, especially how our health and care workers are not um, supported, protected, and invested in. Many health workers have lost their lives, um, have long COVID, have burnt out, um, and still they're facing many challenges. Um, and and uh, particularly this year, as mentioned, um, we need to look at the opportunities in the COVID-19 discussions for pandemic response um, and pandemic preparedness um, to see how do we really take care of our health, health and care workers. It's also the year of the health and care workers announced by the member states of um, uh, the World Health Organization. Um, the generation equality forums are happening. And um, with all this going on, one of the really exciting initiatives that Women in Global Health launched together with the World Health Organization and the government of France is the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce um, Initiative. Uh, and we will be having a high level session this July uh, 1st, um, just coming up on uh, Thursday, um, where we invite all of you to be a part of that and join our conversation by registering for Generation Equality Forum. Um, this initiative uh, focuses on four main pillars, which is uh, increasing the proportion of women leaders in um, health and care uh, roles, um, recognizing the value of women's unpaid uh, and care work and third, protecting women health workers from harassment and violence and fourth, really ensuring all health workers have decent safe work. Um, and these are the four pillars of the initiative we have invited um, uh, 
all different stakeholders, governments especially, uh, but other inter um, intergovernmental agencies, um, NGOs, and I'm really excited that some of the partners speaking today have decided to join on to this initiative. Um, our high level event, um, we will be sharing all those details um, in, the, in the chat function with you. Uh, that's coming up where we will be announcing the exciting commitments that have been made thus far and the commitments will continue. Um, so uh, we will share this um, slide um, through the World Health Summit team for you to learn a bit more about how women in global health is engaged. And uh, given a, the shortage in time, uh, I'm going to at this point, um, just um, uh, share that, you know, the Generation Equality Forum is a commitment maker platform and women in global health is engaged there. And we really invite all of you to join us. Um, the triple gender dividend is about when we have a gender equal health and care workforce, it's gonna lead to a health dividend, a gender a quality dividend and a development dividend. And a health dividend will help us achieve universal health coverage. Gender quality dividend means that women will gain income, education, autonomy, um, leading to overall improvements. And, and uh, more importantly, development dividend, new jobs will be created when we create formal um, health jobs. And our uh, panelists coming from different angles will be unpacking what the triple gender dividend is. On that note, I'll be um, inviting and turning it to uh, my uh, our, our moderator for this session, uh, Dr. Mwanya Kasende, um, who is a uh, global health advisor. And uh, for the sake of time, we will be cutting uh, bios short, but we will be sharing um, her information on the World Health Summit uh, Uganda program. I'm really also excited. She has um, been a co-founder for the Women in Global Health Zambia chapter, and she continues to be a champion for gender equality and an expert in, um, uh, in global health systems and having experience, particularly in the country, Zambia and many others. Um, so Mwenya, I pass, uh, pass the virtual mic to you and uh, thank you for being so patient with us everyone and we're uh, working quickly to you know uh, resolve uh, resolve the technical difficulty so we appreciate the flexibility. Mwenya the floor is yours. Thank you so much Rupa. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today and again apologies for the slight uh, delay and slight technical difficulties. Um, as mentioned, my name is, is Dr. Mwanya Kasonde. I'm a global health consultant, and I'm really excited to be moderating this panel today on the triple dividend, investing in gender equality within the global health workforce. This will be an interactive panel discussion, so please do ask questions through the Q&A function in Zoom and join the conversation. It's such an important conversation for us all to have. Please also do introduce yourselves in the chat, share your views, your perspectives on the topic and as well as any links or any other bits of information that may be of interest to all of us. So just to quickly summarize, the session has four objectives. The first is to increase awareness on gender responsive health systems, which should pay women properly for their work and ensure an equal leadership role in the sector, which can deliver a triple dividend as we're calling it of better health, gender equality and economic growth. The second objective is to address the role that all healthcare stakeholders must play in closing the gender pay gaps and achieving 50% women in health leadership and the importance of civil society, of course, for gender equality and attaining the, the, the sustainable development goals. The third objective is to encourage LMIC governments and health institutions to commit to closing the gender pay gap in the gender gap in payment in health workforce and to addressing the scourge in unpaid work. And to, achieve, and to achieving again 50% women in health leadership roles by 2030. And finally, the session aims to raise awareness on mobilizing civil society in LMIC specifically to advocate for gender equality in the health workforce as part of the commitment for universal health coverage and the sustainable development goals. So you've heard from the Rupa Dat, co-founder and executive director of Women in Global Health. So let me go ahead and invite our panelists to come in with one or two questions. So if you don't mind, uh, Desta, I'm going to start with you. Um, just I really want to start off by putting us all on the table here. We're all here coming from very different sectors. They're coming from the NGO sector. We have governance representatives. Uh, we have the multilateral organizations represent, represented here as well. And you had partnerships at AMREF Africa specifically. Um, so let me start by asking you what you think partners can do better to increase investments in safe and decent equal work for women in healthcare and to enable the triple dividend. Desta, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mwenye. Naturally, I was hoping to share my screen with you, uh, if that's okay. Um, is that okay? Can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead, Dustin. 
Fantastic. Okay, let me just uh, uh, get to. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think I, I don't know if all of our listeners are, are familiar with the work that we do, but I just wanted to share a little bit of background on AMREF so that people understand when we talk about AMREF, why it's so important that an NGO, a Southern based NGO like AMREF is spearheading so many things around gender equity. So we are the largest health development organization, uh, health, health development organization in Africa. Um, based in Africa, we've been around for 60 plus years, and we have quite a number of offices in Europe and North America, 1300 staff, about 130 million income. But what's important is our reach. Our reach is about 38 million per year, and our presence in 35 countries, which makes us a very important partner for both government, private sector, other civil society organizations. So when we look at our partnerships, we look at whom can we reach? Uh, and whom can we engage to really transition and shift things for us. Among our three strategic pillars are, is a focus on human resource for health and gender cuts across all of our three strategic pillars. So there's human resource for health, there's innovative solutions, there's investments. And in all of these three key areas, strategic areas, we focus on women as well. Um, so I guess what I would like to start by saying is, I think we all have to first start where you are. Uh, as an organization, as a partner, you start where you are first and, and make change uh, where you can and where you own that uh, ability to change. So I just wanted to share with you very briefly, even within our organization, how we are managing to shift gender parity and in terms of the staffing numbers, you will see that from 2017 to 2020, we're seeing uh, a, you know, an increase in, in women uh, working within the organization across all of the countries that we're in. You see the leadership team, whether it's group leadership or senior leadership team, uh, above 50% women led. And as we see women leadership, we also see gender balance among our staff. We also feel like as a civil society organization based in Africa that is really advocating for gender parity, we ourselves must in fact be the organization that reflects that. So we look at you know, policies such as you know, a maternity policy of six months, which we never had, a safeguarding policy for the staff, safeguarding policy on sexual abuse and exploitation of beneficiaries. That's really key because we are at a place where we work with ministries of health and other partners to deliver on the ground to the communities. So we're sort of the trusted intermediary and we need to make sure that we also have policies around safeguarding for our beneficiaries. We have a diversity policy and then in terms of our leadership and uh, we are really working on our own internal leadership even as we look at growing the health leadership of uh, women across Africa. Um, so in terms of the work that we do, we know that community health workers or frontline health workers are really critical. And so one of our biggest focus areas, in fact, is to train community health workers or frontline health workers and also mid-level uh, health workers uh, in our system. So you can see that we are intentionally looking at how do we look at the gender balance in terms of training this cadre of health worker that really links community to health facility and generates demand. So these are the people that teach communities around different things, including family planning services, RMNCAH, those kind of key, key services that women uh, in our communities need. So we are increasingly uh, training women um, across uh, Africa. And in, in terms of our reach, you'll see that these community health workers, largely female, are also reaching largely female uh, patients or community members. Um, when we talk about partners, and maybe this is where uh, it's a good example of partnership, uh, when COVID came, we actually have been very much involved with CDC Africa uh, and John Kingasong and his team, and they actually asked us to come in and help them to do COVID response training. 
So over the course of the last year, we have done a significant amount of training. And now the training, of course, um, if you don't do it in person, you have to have mobile technologies to do it. So how do we provide assistive technologies to, to learning and training? And in our case, in COVID response, you'll see we did quite a, a bit of training, among which 67% are women across uh, Zambia, South Africa, Rwanda, Senegal, uh, Guinea, Uganda, Kenya, and Malawi. So we keep pushing and intentionally reaching women because we think it's really critical. Um, our partnerships are not just, this is probably things that you've seen, and the importance of community health workers, uh, first responders, reach trust, community-based, etc. But I think uh, in terms of the stakeholders and partners, some examples from our perspective of really terrific partners are private sector. So when you look at private sector and you look at, for example, a pharma like GlaxoSmithKline, which committed over the last 30 years, it committed about 20% of the profits it makes in least developed communities to be reinvested back to build health systems. So you look at examples like GSK. And so over the past 30 years in 17 countries, they've actually helped train and build capacity of health workers. So these are the kind of partnerships that work with private sector. You also see partnerships in the academic space and uh, with private sector. Uh, for example, in uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, and the University of California and, and Los Angeles and AMREP with others, training around leadership management and governance. Those, those are really important kind of partnerships. And then development assistance organizations also can play a major, major role. We're currently working with JICA and ministries of health across Africa um, uh, to train in, in, in 30 countries to do leadership management and governance training uh, within Africa. So of course, Within that training, we've trained over 25,000 uh, leaders uh, across the continent and about 51% of them are female. So in addition to having funding partners um, uh, support you, I think civil society organizations have to be very intentional about how they invest this money. So those are some of the partners, the government, very, very important uh, partner because they're the ones who can set policy on remuneration and adequate working condition for health workers. They're the ones that really can work to integrate uh, health workers into the formal health system. Uh, they're the ones who can provide, uh, you know, protective environments uh, for community health workers. So those are key partners for us. And then other civil society organizations, because they're the ones that we work with to advocate for improved uh, situations for women or safeguarding or even capacity building and leadership development. So in terms of partnership, the key partners uh, in my view are your funding partners, your government and regional bodies, uh, and civil society as well. Um, so I think uh, with respect to global partners or just partners within the continent even, the key things are really we need more investment uh, to build human resource for health and of course keeping in mind that uh, gender is a very important uh, thing and we need to balance that and then we need to also advocate for gender equal leadership so how do we train uh, how do we provide leadership training for for women uh, on the continent and how do we ensure that that leadership training is also um, connected to mentoring and so this is what some of the things that we do around leadership management and governance um, the advocacy that we do with increasing government inf investments, you know, we do quite a bit of technical study and, and policy frameworks that we share with governments. Uh, we work very closely with them to show them. I mean, we have seen, for example, in Ethiopia and Tanzania, where governments are actually paying community health workers, you're seeing improvements in health status of the country. So we need to have some investment to demonstrate that this is how we can improve health for women and for communities as a whole uh, when we begin to pay our community health workers. So really um, more about being intentional uh, and then focusing also on addressing some of the systemic barriers. So these are the key areas for partnerships uh, when a, uh, from my perspective and that's it. I will stop sharing. 
great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Desta, for giving us those in insights. Um, again, I want to carry on with this spirit of partnership. Um, the WHO, of course, is a key partner in all of this, alongside other multilateral organizations. Desta has brought in the private sector. She's talked about uh, the role of government. Uh, but Bente, if I can turn to you next, uh, we've spoken about COVID, of course, um, but let's speak about the effects, you know, the hidden effects of COVID in terms of neglecting some of the other uh, ongoing, you know, uh, health healthcare threats that, that are unfortunately still with us. And, and your expertise is, is of course, in non-community non -community diseases um, at the WHO. So can I turn to you next and if you can speak to us a little bit more about the context, uh, in the context of the global pandemic and NCDs, what kind of investments you think are important uh, in human resources for health uh, going forward. Dr. Ben David, to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes perfectly. And you can also see my screen. Yes, please go ahead. Very good. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me to this very important meeting. I'm so happy about the initiative, the partnership, and also for being here in general. So I will take the opportunity to sort of link together our triple dividend with the COVID and also the NCD uh, situation in the world because I can never stop advocating for that because it's so much about women, family and livelihood. So um, of course you have already mentioned the situation for the healthcare workers. And we know that women make up 70% of the health workforce as was already mentioned by uh, Rupa and that only 25% of the world health ministers are women. So that is a very challenging fact, but it's also an opportunity for us to work harder to make this change. So we see that we really need the strengthening of women's role and also to extend them beyond the front line to participate in design, implementation and monitoring of health programs. And I think we are all in a deep appreciation for the heroic effect of the global workforce that has been and continues to be on the front lines of COVID-19. And I am in awe of their courage and tireless work to protect us from this deadly disease. And I think if we counted women in this kind of frontline work, it would be even higher numbers. And I would like you to look at the film that was actually winning the, the film festival uh, in WHO in this year. It's called Phosphorus. It's made by a very young uh, first film uh, um, um, producer, and it's really showcasing what we are talking about here today. So I think that uh, when we uh, see what has happened during COVID, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but actually most of the people dying in hospitals uh, during COVID died from, cardio died from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and, and cancer. So the global shortfall, which is already mentioned by both of you on 18 million health workers, primarily in low and middle income country, is really a, a huge demand. And I know that what we are talking about here, the initiative, but also the UN resolutions coming on uh, health workforce uh, last year is very important. So it goes without saying, that when we see the pictures of some of the 13 female ministers in the health across Africa, there is an urgent need to build this capacity. And I truly believe in leadership. So even if we now had you know, the year of the nurses in 2020 and the international year of health and care workers uh, this year, I think that's great initiatives, but it has to be very structured. And that's what uh, brings me to uh, NCD. And what you see here, uh, and I love the picture of a man, by the way, as well, because I think we are all taking care of the whole of the population. You see that seven out of 10 uh, uh, diseases that accounts for the global deaths is actually non-communicable diseases. So it is ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases and also uh, uh, cancers, that is really the diseases that kill most people in the world. You cannot compare this actually to the communicable diseases and even unfortunately not to the uh, figures from COVID as you know. 
And I think this is also a moment where we have to think in gender sensitive health systems. So one thing is about gender sensitive leadership, but I think we, we also need to really uh, look through uh, how these diseases is affecting both social income, uh, of course, le levels, but also women. So when I showed this uh, figure to uh, um, the executive director from UN Women some years ago, she could hardly not believe me that 6.2 million women is dying too early from non-communicable diseases every year. And we know that it's possible to uh, uh, make this different. So 15 million annual deaths could be actually um, prevented. And so far, the last 10 years, we have lost 150 million premature deaths, meaning dying before 70 years of age from NCD. And if we are not working harder and realize this, we will lose 200 million more people and a huge amount of them is women in the next 10 years, 200 million people. And since we are discussing also equity, we know that this is really impacting on equity. So these huge accounts of vets is, uh, is of course hitting countries and within countries very differently. And it's very much linked to poverty, as you can imagine. So I want to say that uh, what we have learned from COVID is that uh, the preparedness cannot only focus on virus. It, can, it has to focus on the virus, but it has to focus on the health system strengthening. So what we saw already from May this year or last year, sorry, was that it was a 50% disruption of all these major diseases. So 50% of people living with cancer, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases and lung diseases didn't get access to uh, the health system. So when we are not building back um, uh, stronger and fairer, we need to really take into account the building of the health system and the leadership. So um, we checked actually the national uh, response and, and preparedness plans in November. And only six of the 82 plants we looked at mentioned diabetes, which we know is a very uh, high risk factor of dying from the virus. And only 16 of the plants actually at all mentioned the NCD. So I think if we combine, you know, over focus now on gender sensitive uh, uh, health systems, the potential that lies in uh, really stepping up the female leadership in the world and also combine this with the preparedness that needs to come by strengthening healthcare systems uh, and then including NCD which is the big trunk of diseases into UHC I think we are on to something so I'm very pleased with the initiative and I want to come back when we uh, are uh, discussing in the panel thank you so so far Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bente. Um, I see an interesting question in the chat here, and you've mentioned one or two interesting points around the year of the health and care worker. And Joseph from Uganda has made a comment to mention that he sees when he sees human resources for health, he thinks we miss all other allied health professionals. Is there something that you can consider in the future? Maybe you want to comment on that as well, Dr. Bente. I think that is totally true. And it's very interesting because this year, uh, the member states of WHO passed a resolution on oral health. So of course, what we immediately saw was that the hygienist, the, the dental um, professional workforce was stepping out and really requiring space, but also commitment. And we see the same that, you know, when, when, when the mitigation came true, um, because of this big disruption of uh, health system during COVID, we saw completely new people and professions stepping in, and especially the digital um, uh, workers, I would say, because they were the one really um, providing new innovative ways of providing healthcare uh, through telemedicine, but also to uh, provision of medicines that was not sort of in the tra traditional healthcare system. And I think we also need to really focus on the um, educational sector. 
uh, when I met with the people living with diabetes uh, linked to our new global diabetes um, compact uh, earlier this year, they really stressed the point of capacity building, the education and the health literacy. And this is far beyond you know, the traditional uh, workforce within the health system. So again, a multi-sectoral approach also when we speak about, um, let's say health workforce or the workforce needed for strengthening our health system is very important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, and I'm just picking up again in the chat following up talking on rehabilitation professionals as well, which is not very much promoted because of the wrong impression that rehab is expensive and people cannot sustain it. And I think there's an important point that has been raised here in the chat, um, discussing the entire continuum of care. We're talking about preventative medicine as well as curative and rehabilitative and, and palliative as well. And and if I could um, comment on that as well. So I was talking about the disruption that we were able to document, which was really, I think, alarm, alarming for most people. And rehabilitation were even more impacted. So we had up till 70% disruption during COVID of rehabilitation. And you would be pleased to know that we just launched a, a competency framework for rehabilitation from WHO. And if you look at this, you will see that it's far beyond the traditional healthcare workers and it's really sort of uh, spanning programs and the continuum of care. So I totally agree, this is very, very important. Brilliant, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I was hoping to bring in some of our government, government counterparts at this stage, but unfortunately it seems like Dr. Mercy from the Ministry of Health of Kenya is unwell um, and unable to join us today. So maybe I can go back to you, Desta. Again, we've, talked, we've spoken about key partners, including the WHO, and you've also told us about the work that AMRF is doing. Um, but I want to give us some practical examples. Maybe you have some specific examples um, of how partners together have invested in human resources for health. You know, we speak about the problems a lot. Sometimes it's good to talk about the solutions. So, so maybe you have one or two examples to give us on practically how partners have invested in human resources for health and um, specifically benefiting the, the triple dividend again. Thanks, OG Desta. Desta, you're on mute. That's a, that's a very common phrase in Zoom calls, you're on mute. Uh, what I was going to say was, Bente mentioned uh, the issue of health literacy, uh, and that's really important. And for us, you know, being in a position where we are really the intermediaries between the community and access to first level access to care, it's really, really important to be able not only to build the capacity of health workers in the communities themselves, but also to ensure uh, that we have health literacy. So for example, when COVID came, we actually launched with a number of other partners, a national business compact on COVID. And uh, within that partnership, there was private sector, those who manufactured, uh, you know, hand washing soaps, uh, uh, those type of things, the government was involved, other private sector partners, civil society organizations, technology organizations. And when we, what we saw in that kind of partnership was the first thing when COVID came was, and this was in March, uh, 2019, when, when we launched it, when the first case of COVID came to Kenya or was identified in Kenya. So what we did is we gathered as many uh, partners as we could including also UN agencies. And we developed um, messaging framework for health you know, literacy around COVID and, and what you could do. So risk communication was really critical. We were able to use and leverage our partners' billboards, uh, radio spots, television. You know, how do we reach that? You know, how do we reach the mass? And the way to reach the mass is use leverage everyone's resources, whether it's supply chain. We had people who were in the supply chain space delivering uh, water facilities. We had community health workers trained, delivering uh, messaging and health literacy on, on COVID and uh, social distancing. We had, uh, you know, every, the government supporting and, and uh, endorsing the messaging. So 
when you have partners and, you know, at that time, you know, I always say business has heart because businesses across the region came and said, what is it that we can do? How can we partner for better intervention, for improved health outcomes, for these kind of things? So this is the National Business Compact is a model where we used and leveraged private sector strength, uh, agility, supply chain, the government's um, you know, the government's role in setting the standards and uh, and approving the messaging, the uh, manufacturers of all of these supplies. So we pulled all those together and out of, I think, 17,000 identified health, uh, you know, areas where there were water shortages, we were able to deliver about 14,000 uh, hotspot areas with uh, water facilities. We were able to raise funds through many different partners to respond to uh, emergency needs of the government. So setting up the, the phone systems, the call center, uh, setting up um, quarantine facilities, supporting that. So we were able to really leverage all of our partners. And, and this is when you know partnership works because some partners come in with funding, uh, Rockefeller uh, foundation, for example, came and said, what is it that's needed? Oxygen is needed. How do we make sure we enable that for the communities? And who do we use as an intermediary to make sure that that is delivered to community and to community hospitals? And so it's really looking at that kind of uh, mapping of who the key stakeholders are, who can be leveraged. And sometimes they're non-traditional partners. I'll give you an example, Trademark East Africa. Really, its focus is looking at the trade routes north to south in East Africa. And they came and, and got to partner with us to be able to train people and provide water facilities also at border posts so that the economy uh, wasn't stagnant. The economy could continue the way it should. And so it's looking at, you know, outside of our typical scope of a funder, who comes in for program funding, and then we deliver a program. So we looked at who are the people who are affected? How can we respond to you know, closing of, of trading posts? Or, and, and how do we deliver value there? It's by really partnering with non-traditional partners as well. So Trademark East Africa AMREF is a very unique example of how a health development organization can partner with a trade organization to ensure that trading posts are safe, that truck drivers are able to go from one uh, country to another and, and uh, you know, go across borders to continue trading and keep the economy up, alive and well. So these are examples, I think, uh, that are really um, uh, illustrate very well how you can, if you have your mind set on it, and if your intention is to reach the community, then you look out for partners beyond your, beyond the normal uh, partners that you have. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Desta. Um, and again, I'm I'm going along the line of partnerships here. I think it's important that we're all at the table, be it private sector, be it multilaterals, NGOs, and indeed govern governments. Um, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Rupa again. If I can bring you back into the conversation, Rupa, because I know that you obviously have a lot to say here. Um, Let's talk about the role of, of governments. Um, Women in Global Health through the Gender Equity Hub has been key in influencing policy. Um, and as you know, recently governments have committed to ratifying and implementing ILO Convention 190 on, um, on elimination of gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work um, by 2023, also as part of Generation Equality Forum uh, commitments. So maybe you can tell us about the significance of this and what difference this could make for women in the health and care workforce. Great. Thank, thank you, Moanya. Uh, really, really glad to be uh, back and tuning in. But I, I, I also want to just say, I believe Dr. Moadi has been able to join us. So I will keep my answer very brief and, um, and also turn it back to you to introduce her and um, get her perspectives on, on some of these topics we've been discussing. But this particular convention, um, 190, um, uh, the convention that really can, uh, is targeting to ensure that all forms of um, harassment and violence and workplaces that are informal and formal will benefit all of society, but it especially applies 
to the health and care workforce because we um, hear about the, the violence um, that health workers are facing and that is um, heightened and increased during the pandemic time, especially with the spread of misinformation. Uh, but we know particularly women face um, higher levels of sexual harassment and violence. Um, and there's uh, a lot of bullying that happens as well. And all of these things learn lead to not only um, the immediate um, effects of uh, facing um, all those conditions, but also the long-term effects of the, the mental um, and psychosocial implications of um, you know, being in, a, in an abusive workplace. And so this convention is our opportunity to legally um, have countries ratify a global convention and create a legal uh, framework and, and then at the national level to ensure that all, all workplaces, both formal and formal, and half of what women do in the health sector um, is in, um, in unpaid and often in informal settings. So this convention also has an opportunity um, to look in those settings. And if um, all the women are uh, protected uh, the way they should be, um, then we will no longer have as many you know, weak systems where we're depending on some of the poorest women to subsidize healthcare for us. And if we can't keep them safe, how can they keep us safe? So um, this convention is really, a, a really an opportunity to work with governments, um, to work with unions, and um, uh, especially the labor aspect aspect um, labor ministries to really bring uh, lasting reform um, to the sector and it's um, long overdue and very much needed. Uh, we need to turn that applause of health workers into action. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Mwenya. Great, thank you so much, um, Rupa. I think it's important to bring that in. It's such an important part of this um, of this of this uh, of this agenda. Um, Dr. Murti, you're very welcome to this discussion. Um, sorry for the slight technical difficulties you had earlier, but we're certainly delighted to have you here. Um, and maybe I can ask you the next question. Um, as ways of introductions, um, I think most of the the buyers are all found on on the on the meeting website, but we're all very much familiar with with who Dr. Murti is, the WHO Regional Director for Africa, and the first woman I have to add to occupy that, that position, which is very exciting. So maybe Dr. Moretti, you can tell us um, how, from your perspective, investing in the health workforce, specifically in women, of course, has contributed to health delivery um, on the continent. Over to you, Dr. Moretti. Okay, uh, thanks so much, um, Moenya, and uh, greetings to everyone. Greetings, Rupa, my fellow panelists and the participants. Apologies for having joined you late. I, I think the initial technical problem joined with having a almost elderly woman uh, presented a challenge and I've had to call in my team to, to connect me. Um, well, you know, I, I think that um, certainly you've touched on why it's so important to, to invest in the health workforce and specifically women. And, and I'm sure it's already been, been stated that um, that women constitute the majority of the health workforce. And um, in our region, especially, we still struggle with uh, the size of the workforce. There are still acute sh shortages of health workers at all levels. And uh, especially, we need really women leaders, uh, more women leaders at the top of, um, of our health workforce. It can make a huge amount of difference. I think we've, we've, we've seen that um, investing in community health workers, first first and foremost, and just to pick up on what Rupa was saying, that uh, that tradition in the past of community health workers being somehow thanked in kind by their neighbors, generally low-income workers and low-income communities, was a great injustice. And it just made uh, the attempts to establish the link at the, at the community level so fragile in our health systems for decades. So I, I think this investment in their salaries needs to be formalized. It needs to be part of the structure of the public health systems and increasingly, I'm sure, private health systems so they get a consistent, predictable, and hopefully progressively fair uh, remuneration for the huge work that they do. And then investing in um, health workers at the primary level in, in, and mainly here we're talking about nurses, we're talking about women we've seen can have huge um, positive outcomes in relation to, to many, many problems. So training people, investing in um, progressively fair remuneration, which continues to be a big uh, challenge in the region uh, and ensuring then that they have supportive environments in which to work, which are also 
fair and uh, just focusing on women, ensuring that uh, not only the, the professional needs, but also the multiple roles that they play in society and families are addressed can make a big difference. I mean, if we look at some of the achievements that have been made in the African region um, in reducing maternal deaths, even if we still have big problems, that really is the work of midwives being trained better, being better available, and having referral systems that enable them to play that role in stopping women dying. The number of um, the progress with uh, reducing child deaths in Africa is largely due to immunization programs and uh, community level interventions for children that have uh, improved our child mortality. We just celebrated last year having eradicated wild poliovirus from the region. And uh, that was also very much the work of frontline healthcare workers supported effectively and sometimes in the most difficult circumstances, including in uh, conflict areas where health workers have been killed, including women health workers. So, so investing in those people and their skills, we, we found people who were able to innovate under the most difficult circumstances to have access to children who were not vaccinated and to come back and to communicate with uh, families, communities to enable them to have access um, right up to innovating using technology to be able to communicate, carry out surveillance uh, and all of that needed investment in their skills, investment in the context and their working conditions and investment in their leadership and enabling people to have uh, conducive environments of working under sometimes very challenging circumstances that then made them productive. Uh, and I think uh, I'll just stop there and say particularly our own interest here. Uh, we know that women on the front lines tend to be nurses, midwives, community health workers. So the, these women, if invested in, in terms of training, in terms of creating the space for them, in terms of making them feel recognized. So, you know, when I talk to my women colleagues, they say, um, yes, we are harassed in different ways, but one of the biggest gaps they feel is recognition of their value and their worth and the reinforcement of their capacities uh, and their sense of confidence from in themselves. If that happens, they produce fabulous results. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Magic Moeti, for that very valuable insight. Um, I, I'm going to turn to, to Dr. Bente next. Um, we, we've been reminded about the importance of the, the continuum of care. And I think Dr. Mwerti has made some very important points here in terms of addressing the health systems at all levels, be it at a global level, regional level, national level, indeed the subnational level as well. Um, so maybe we can touch a little bit more about um, the community and specifically primary health care as well um, in NCDs. Maybe you can tell us what you see um, women health and care work because uh, you know, what role they play at the community level and, and how do we ensure from your perspective that their work is valued and properly rewarded as, as raised here by, by Dr. Moeti. Dr. Bente, over to you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. And, and I just also want to, if, if, if I may, to come a little bit back to the partnership and what is really making me happy nowadays and that has really changed in the years I had since I joined WHO. So it's my eighth, eighth year and I can see that especially I would say triggered I think by the raised awareness but also the COVID situation we have new partners stepping up. So really the capacity building of uh, healthcare workers in the broad uh, sort of understanding of healthcare workers has now been picked up by development agencies like the Norwegian one, the, go the, the government of Denmark, government of Germany, but we also see Resolve to Save Life, uh, World Diabetes Foundation. So it's really amazing now that the sort of the more coherent leadership and understanding of the situation really support us. So I, I just wanted to say that. But of course, I totally agree with um, Dr. Moetti that, uh, you know, where we really need to focus is on community-based care. And I think we have a lot to learn from HIV uh, and early days HIV and also uh, in many areas, polio and uh, TB malaria. 
so again, coming back to uh, that NCD is the biggest killer and we, I, I think the aim now is to really reach the sustainable development goal with 30% re reduction in premature mortality. And if we are going to do that, meaning saving 200 million lives in the next 10 years, we have to step up. And you're asking me the, the role of women, you know, in a sense, there are almost only women in this space. So I think what we need to do is to focus on the female leadership, give them the, the healthcare workers also a seat at the table, but also together, and again, coming back to HIV, in a co-creation with the people living with the diseases. So I think this combination can be really powerful, sort of empowering and those already there uh, edu educate and build capacity and continue to build partnership, but co-create with the people living with the diseases. And this is the part we have, I, mean, I, I think, more or less ignored a little bit when it comes to cancer, diabetes, and so on. So, you know, seeing now triggering uh, the, the community of people living with is so powerful and it gives us new innovative ideas. And I, I would like to also come back to, um, you know, the, the initiative that was launched uh, by uh, the governments of uh, government of France and WHO and uh, Women in Global Health, because I think we can be very proud because I think the four uh, topic areas, both the increased proportion, but also, as mentioned by Ropa again, the unpaid uh, uh, and the value of unpaid uh, healthcare, but hopefully not to continue to be out, uh, unpaid, but really to, to make it professional. And also, uh, as we have seen in many countries now during emergency, that we cannot stop talking about uh, protecting from harassment and violence in the workplaces. And I think this is scary for many women. And I think we, as, um, as policymakers, as uh, UN agencies, really need to support that work. So, um, so I think we, we see where we need to go. Uh, and we have a lot of measures coming out of WHO. We have a special initiative on pr primary health care uh, and a combination of this with very programmatic uh, initiatives as well. Uh, should be enough sort of tools to help us there. So I think now it's about will, partnership, and, and really moving towards this. Thank you. And I'm very proud to have a female leader like uh, Moeti as a model in this space. So I think this is uh, in itself, you know, super inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bente. I'm going to keep you on, on the spot, if you don't mind. It's just we have a question <laughs> here um, in the chat from Anne Mawate. Um, and the question is, how can we amplify the preventative approach to dealing with NCDs? So our main approach in NCD has been and is still the preventative part. So it is really about a more healthy lifestyle. And I think you have seen the very alarming numbers now, figures going up on obesity in all parts of the world. So you have now many countries having both sort of uh, almost hunger, but absolutely malnutrition, uh, undernutrition and obesity at the same time, just to make an example. So, I mean, there, there cannot be anything else than really focusing on uh, uh, stop smoking, reduce uh, harmful uh, use of alcohol, but very importantly, focus on the food, the food system, and also the physical inactivity. So what we see is that more or less half to two third of the impact that we can achieve to reduce premature mortality on NCD lies in the field of population-based uh, uh, preventive measures. I would like to add that what we have focused also this year, and that very much comes from COVID again, is that in addition, we cannot ignore the people already uh, contracted with uh, non-communicable diseases. So this is also about you know, making it possible for all governments to do the right investments so we can have a basic level of care, but also to improve the secondary prevention. So all of this needs to be in place, but it has to start with uh, you know, uh, taxation on, on, on tobacco, uh, sugar sweetened beverages, 
that we really build the cities so we can um, continue to be physically active and so on. Thank and you. again, if we bring it back to the gender perspective, I mean, it's just uh, goes without saying that, you know, it starts with the families as well. So women is very often uh, the, let's say, the natural teachers in this space. So I would like to add that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bente. So can, I, can I say just one thing on this, uh, if, if you don't mind? Yes, that's since I, used to, since I used to work in this area, I, I think, um, you know, one thing that we'll need to, to look at in terms of healthy foods is the kind of pricing and marketing of unhealthy foods so, so that this doesn't become an individual responsibility. You, you should know better, you should eat better. I, I think we find in many cases, especially people at the lower end of the income scale, and I mean, I see this in countries in Africa when I travel and in Southern Africa, that the healthier the foods, vegetables, food, they are more expensive. Mm -hmm. And the more, the, you know, food that's affordable is a food that's bad for you generally. When I travel around Africa, when I, when, what I see on the billboards is sugar, oil, and, uh, and alcohol basically being advertised and put in those salty uh, things that you use to, to flavor your foods. So, so there, I think we need to do something around the marketing and I suppose supporting the production affordably of healthy foods, local vegetables and fruits, so and, and encouraging people to eat that. I think that's very important because we know, of course, that we've got a very powerful industries whose job is to create and grow their markets, and, and we, we need to support people to, to be able to withstand that. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I may add one more thing to this, because, um, and again, this is a little bit about uh, partnership and of course to protecting public health. So what we see now is that the regular dialogues that we have with the private sector actually uh, helps. So uh, uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Francesca Branca, who's leading the work on nutrition, we're able now to get commitments from industry to take out trans fat, for example. And that's a very good first step. So I think, you know, also to be able to hold the other partners accountable is extremely important in this space. We cannot do this alone, but of course the government has a very special role in regulating and taxation and also to um, protect the, the, the health of the population by undue influence. So um, totally agree. Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Moiti, if you don't mind, um, because of course, all of this is very, very important. We've spoken about NCDs. Uh, we've spoke, we know about the, the importance of maintaining, you know, essential health services, but, but we're, we're dealing with a pandemic, as you all know, and, and how do we do this in the context of a pandemic? And the reason why I want to turn to you specifically is because you've mentioned, of course, uh, the declaration of the end of polio in the region, and as well, the, the Ebola outbreak we know in Guinea has been declared over, uh, which, is, which are all fantastic achievements. So, so you've done this before, how do we do it again, Dr. Witt, in the context of the COVID pandemic? Wow, well, I, I mean, I think um, I think it's just building on sometimes very painful learnings and on partnership, and ultimately, I I, I think on um, on communities and on those people who are working closest to communities. Now, I'm very obsessive now with my colleagues in the, the, the program that, that uh, works on, on outbreaks and pandemics that I do not accept. When we hear that there's, there's an outbreak maybe somewhere, I don't accept that you send a usually male epidemiologist and somebody to do data. You need to establish immediately contact with the communities there and you need to send somebody who knows how to talk to people. And that may not be an epidemiologist or a data, a data analyzer. The, so that connection, and very often, of course, that also is a woman, is somebody who, who is looking after sick people and seeing what's going on. There's a funny disease showing up here and then working it up the system generally so that you, you have the capacity built up for somebody to be able to, to take a specimen correctly or call on somebody from a lab to come see what's going on while supporting the community to play their role. That's vitally important. I, I think outbreaks, start and stop at the level of individuals and communities. And until we get that straight and find a smart way to combine it with the science, the 
technologies that we have, we will always be running around in circles and seeing people riot in the streets because they don't understand why they should stay away from their families and stay away from their work and see their incomes collapse. So I, I, I think there again, and we, we saw that in the very difficult Ebola outbreak in the Eastern DRC, which lasted for a couple of years, is when finally we got in touch with the women's groups, with the religious groups, and they were the ones who sometimes were able to, uh, to, to calm down. So, so those the militias that were attacking the healthcare workers that killed one of our colleagues and, and that were setting us back at, at every moment. So having that good combination of uh, you know, science, technical experts, and very much simplifying this so that people at the community level, your community healthcare workers, the nurse at the primary care, level can understand it, translate it to people, and they can then incorporate it into the behavior that we preach at them about on television in technical jargon. Then that's when you start to get things changing. So I think that again, that they are very much translators of all that, at, at that interface between the health system and people. And then using technology, you know, we, we must do the science as well and do it smartly for the context in which we are working in, in, in African countries. It's, it, it's again to do with investment, with partnerships, working with local community groups, with the private sector, which can invest a lot in, in co-building the capacities, and then with international partners who bring uh, expertise and resources. And the governments, of course, have very much to play their role. I mean, and here, we, you know, we, we've had some very tragic, and as you, as you know, uh, events of sexual exploitation of people working in this space. And in WHO, we're working very hard to develop our women uh, experts to also be present in these operations. Generally, they are very much dominated by men and that somehow has created the, the environment and the opportunities for some abuses which are really very regrettable. Thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Moti. And I have one last question for you. We're, we're almost out of time. We're about to close the discussion, um, but we're, we're so glad to have you, you all here. This time is really so precious. Um, so I want to go further on the engagement with the local partners. It's so easy to have these global level and even regional level discussions, uh, but we, we often forget that the, the community indeed are the implementers. They're the ones that are doing the work, uh, you know, really on the ground. So maybe you can tell us um, from just from the chat here, um, how you and your team at the WHO Regional Office work specifically with local partners uh, to accelerate gender responsive health systems and, and women's leadership in the region. Sorry, you're on mute. Doctor. Great. I'm unmuted. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And I have to confess from the get-go that we are at the start of looking for local partners to engage with. At the moment in WHO, we've been very much focused on developing our own women leadership of, within the organization in the region, because we have a very severe and challenging gender disparity to, to deal with. So we've invested in the last few years in a, a leadership training program with a big focus on, on women. We run special uh, trainings for women leaders, so middle and senior level women. Senior meaning they've been in WHO for many years, but really could uh, could be appointed to more senior positions in terms of our functions and our structures. So I'm very much focused on developing explicitly this uh, cadre of women leaders within WHO in, significant, in a significant proportion of, of, our, of our team. I'm very proud that we just restructured the regional office and we now have gender parity in our senior executive management team. So if I'm sitting in the room with my directors, there are four women and three men. I think that's really great. So we're trying to do this as well for our women heads of country offices. At the moment, only a third of, of the heads of WHO country offices are women. And we've, we've started a very exciting uh, program with the UN Volunteers Program, which we call the Africa Young Women Championship Champions Initiative, and have brought on board a lot of young women as volunteers. I'm quite confident some of them will then transition into, um, into our leadership. We've run the same program for here in the Congo, where we are based, with the Ministry of Health, so for them to start to train women leaders. And I'm very much encouraging my colleagues to uh, extend 
this initiative in the countries where we are to local groups. So to reach out to local professional groups, women, and offer this training. And then we have a mentoring program that goes along with it as well, so that we connect women with uh, more senior women as mentors and uh, start to create that sense of a community, a support system for women. And, and believe me, if you are looking out, all you have to do is to encourage the women, go for that position. I, I can't believe the number of times I've reached out to a colleague and say, why don't you apply? And then I step back completely and don't interfere in the process and they wash up. I've got three fabulous women directors and all over, even at, at the more middle level. Um, so people need to be told that you're worth, you're worth it, you're great, go for it. That, that's what I've seen with my experience. And if I'm working with local partners, that, that, that would be my key message to them. You know, go for it, encourage women, con get connected to women who support you and tell you that you're brilliant, you're good enough, and you'll get selected. This is what I've seen. Great. Thank you once again. I think we'll close with those, those words. You're worth it. You're great. Go for it. Brilliant. It's been a fantastic discussion today. I'm so delighted that you're all able to join us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give closing words to, to Wendy Muya from, from, Wood, from Women in Global Health. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I'd love to have carried on, uh, but let us continue the conversation offline as well as online. Um, Wendy, over to you for final words. Thank you, Mwenya. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to each of you. I'd like to thank our esteemed speakers for their insights and their leadership and just contributing to this very important discussion. And I'd also like to thank everyone who's part participating virtually from across the world. Um, it's very important that we have these timely discussions right now on the triple dividend and the global health workforce, because as it was mentioned, 2021 is also the year, the international year for health and care workers. Um, the Generation Equality Forum is starting this week and it is providing a great opportunity for advocacy on increasing investment in decent, safe and equal jobs for women in the health and care workforce. I'd like to leave three points just as I finish. Um, to achieve gender equality within the global health workforce, women in health and in the care sector will need a new and more equal social contract. We must also enable health workers to lead, especially midwives and nurses who have tremendous power and also community trust. Two, women's movements are leading radical change. Funding institutions should invest in such movements at national, regional, and global levels so that they can keep leaders and different stakeholders accountable to achieving gender equity in health. We must also challenge power and privilege that perpetuates inequality at all levels for there to be decent work, safety, dignity, and fair pay, and equal leadership in the health workforce. Lastly, Women in Global Health is a platform for all voices. We welcome you to join us. We have 25 existing chapters and 37 in different countries across the world in the pipeline. You can check out our website to learn more about how to start or join a chapter. And as we eventually reimagine and rebuild after the pandemic, we must ensure that the lives and rights of women and girls go forward and not backwards. I leave you with these inspirational words from Mangari Madai. There comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, and that time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for a brilliant closing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's really been a fantastic uh, discussion today on the triple dividend, investing in gender equality within the global health workforce. Thank you to the Women in Global Health team and to the World Health Summit for hosting us. Uh, please remember to follow Women in Global Health on Twitter and to look at the website, as Wendy has just mentioned. Enjoy the ongoing discussions at this year's World Health Summit Africa Regional Meeting. I wish you a fruitful rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.